Right. So I think that disagreement between the judges, McKechnie and O'Donnell, which I addressed at the tail end of the setup video just now, uh, goes to the heart of this whole case. Right. McKechnie thinks that the natural law words in Article 41 are to be taken seriously, but not literally. Whereas O'Donnell disagrees. O'Donnell thinks that we can't water down the words of a constitutional provision, that you know we have to give them their ordinary meaning. And as I say, as I say, I think that McKechnie's approach to that question facilitates his more liberal approach then to which rights actually fall to be protected under Article 41. So let's move then to O'Donnell's judgment. And I think I should begin with a good metaphor he uses in paragraph 46 of his judgment, where he talks about those words in Article 41, the first subsection thereof, being a signpost, not a springboard. A signpost, not a springboard. What he means is the words should be understood as a signpost to other parts of the text of the Irish Constitution, which text then sheds light on, illuminates what rights fall to be protected under the article, rather than as a springboard, by which he means a springboard for judges to look out into the ether and identify rights that they are looking to their hearts, perhaps, and identify rights that they, the judges, happen to think ought to be protected by Article 41 of the Constitution. So in other words, O'Donnell, you might say, is being a textualist here. I don't think that's quite the right description of it. Uh, he certainly is disavowing, if you like, the natural law approach of certain predecessors from different eras of Irish constitutional law. And I have in mind in particular uh, Hugh Kennedy's approach in State, Ryan and Lennon, which I addressed in other videos. Now, I think O'Donnell has his eye here on the bigger picture, on the bigger trajectory of Irish constitutional law. Uh, he refers early in his judgment, uh, I think strikingly, to the notion of unspecified super rights to be discerned by future generations of judges, that Article 41 should not be understood in those terms. Of course he has his eye, I think, on Hugh Kennedy, on perhaps Justice Brian Walsh's judgment in McGee and the Attorney General. These are, these are some of the biggest precedents, most compelling precedents in, in ways in the history of Irish constitutional law. And what O'Donnell is saying is, look, that way of thinking about the constitution is, is problematic, I think, from the point of view of legitimacy, democratic legitimacy. But he is not, to my mind, at all preferring the rigid formalism of, for instance, Gerald Fitzgibbon in State, Ryan and Lennon. I think if you think about it, what, you, what you're seeing here is, is a a novel philosophy, really, of constitutional interpretation in, in, in Ireland, that you, you're seeing traces of this over the last four, five, six years, Frank Clark, Chief Justice Frank Clark, in particular, you see it, for instance, in the Friends of the Irish Environment case uh, from perhaps 12 months ago, when Clark, Chief Justice, uh, you know, referred to the notion of derived rights rather than unenumerated rights, because it in, it, in, in, it indicates more firmly that these rights are to be derived from the text of the Irish Constitution rather than judges casting their eyes out into the ether and looking into their hearts, as I say, for these unspecified super rights. In line with all of this, at another point of his judgment, O'Donnell refers to what he calls the vertical and horizontal limits applying to Article 41 rights. Vertical and horizontal limits. Now, I haven't thought this through enough yet, but for the moment, I'm going to describe this as the shoebox, as O'Donnell's shoebox account of Article 41. And I have in mind in particular a shoebox that's standing on its end, the tall shoebox, rather than the long flat shoebox. And, and why? Well, he has in mind the notion that whatever rights, look again at 41 and you'll see that it doesn't specify what rights the family enjoys. It just refers to rights that the family enjoys. So, so what rights, what kinds of rights fall to be protected under Article 41 is the question. I think he is concerned, for reasons I 
kind of gestured at some time ago to rein the to make sure that this is restricted rein it in tighten it in hence the kind of the, the tall shoebox okay so uh, and, and then of course also he recognizes or acknowledges that whatever rights are do fall to be protected under the article enjoy an extraordinarily high uh, degree of protection hence the tall shoebox What then is in the shoebox and what's outside of the shoebox? Well, let's use the signposts, O'Donnell says. And the best signpost for the first subsection in Article 41 is the second subsection in Article 41. And that opens with the line, the state therefore guarantees to protect the family in its constitution and authority. Now that means that whatever these extraordinarily sacrosanct rights that pertain to the family under the first subsection have to do with two things, the family's constitution and the family's authority. Now he says, let's, okay, well I'm saying, let's leave the constitution matter, the constitution of the family to one side for a moment and focus on the decision-making authority, the authority or autonomy. Obviously this means, O'Donnell says, you know, that the, the family has a certain sphere within which it has prima facie primary decision making the state is not should put out it's not the business of the state now he says well what kinds of decisions obviously not all decisions it could not be that uh, what kinds of decisions fall within that domain or are in that shoebox um, if you will well he says let's take a look at the immediately following section or clause of the irish constitution in article 41 which is the embarrassing and sexist woman in the home clause now he describes it as controversial Okay, I'm sure he has the same views or attitudes about the woman in the home clause as you uh, and I and everybody else uh, have. Right, he says, whatever you might think of it, it tends to suggest that Article 41 pertains to home or domestic oriented matters rather than public facing matters. And then he goes on to make suggestions around, well, you know, the length of your child's hair, for instance, what time your child goes to bed, those kinds of decisions having to do with the rearing of kids. You know, decisions having to do with education, where a kid goes to school, and he looks then at Article 42 on that. Decisions, he says, even with respect to whether or not your child gets the vaccine that is a standard kind of a vaccine or whatever. Um, gesturing, of course, at the NWHB case, he looks and references also the matrimonial homes bill case, you know, whether both partners work, for instance, or whether one of them works part-time or one of them works at home and the other doesn't. These are matters that are the decision-making domain of the family, prima facie. He says what he's really getting at is the more a decision has public implications or has a public orientation, the more, in other words, a decision has to do in this context with the immigration system of the state, the less it tends to fall within Article 41. As for what he says about the families being protected in respect of its constitution, I won't say a whole lot about that other than to say he, he refers to that being its composition, you know, its makeup. You know, clearly he suggests it had to do, or what the drafters had in mind was the notion of divorce initially. Also that there are adoption clauses in Article 42a, for instance. You know, in other words, that has to do with the notion that the makeup, the composition of the family, is the business of the family. Prima facie. The right to cohabit, which McKechnie suggests, does follow from Article 41, doesn't seem to fall, it doesn't even seem to, doesn't seem to go to the notion of the composition of the family. It doesn't seem to go to the notion of the authority of the family necessarily, the decision-making authority of the family as such. He says, so he doesn't see why we ought to identify it as a super right that is protected, or one of these sacrosanct rights protected, under Article 41. Now, I don't mean to suggest really at all that O'Donnell is playing some kind of game here. I think this is good faith interpretation of constitutional provisions, and I think it is very very plausible or very even compelling, persuasive, say what you call it what you will, 
the interpretation of clauses of the Constitution. He's doing his job uh, to the best of his uh, considerable uh, analytical skill. Um, I do wonder whether there aren't also, as there are with all of us, <laughs> all when we interpret things, other considerations in play. Right, so I've already mentioned one, the fact that he is concerned, I think, with the dr dramatic, strident language of the natural rights phrases in 41 section 1 1. Uh, I also wonder whether there isn't a concern, or it's not being influenced to some extent, by the fact that Article 41 appears to only apply to marital families because of 41 section 3. Now that means if you house a right to cohabit in Article 41, it applies only to marital families and not to non-marital families, and that doesn't seem to make sense, given that the Constitution protects the dignity of the individual. So if it's going to be a right that enjoys constitutional status, it seems very, very compelling that it would fall to be protected under Article 40, not under Article 41. Now, if it was protected under Article 40, it wouldn't have this super status brought about by the uh, natural rights language in Article 41 as well. In that same vein, he says some very innovative things uh, towards the back end of his judgment pertaining to what we might call non-marital, intimate, committed relationships. First of all, he suggests that such relationships of some permanence where two people treat themselves and are recognised by others as a unit, uh, in addition to their standing as individuals, that that intimate relationship is something of constitutional value. I think he's pointing out something that is perhaps quite obvious in one sense, but uh, is maybe overlooked because of the emphasis on marriage in Article 41. He also says, or points out, I suppose, that other than in Article 41, Section 3 itself, that is the marriage clause, Articles 41 and 42, concerned as they are with the family, don't expressly limit the protections they offer to marital families alone. In other words, he is opening up the possibility that Article 41 would more broadly be understood to protect non-marital as well as marital families. In conclusion then, I've already suggested, I think this O'Donnell judgment in Gary really seems to capture the philosophy of this Irish Supreme Court, uh, to me, to, to my mind. It speaks to the, the direction it has been on over the last five or ten years and is likely to remain on, I think, over the next five or ten years. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting for the nature of the disagreement between McKechnie and O'Donnell. By the way, McKechnie defends himself very well from any suggestion that he is, you know, going out into the ether to identify rights that he would like to be in the Constitution and therefore is finding in the Constitution. He defends himself very well from such a, a suggestion. But, you know, what you see here is a very significant disagreement, but between two judges who are very much engaged in the same interpretive enterprise. Whereas I think, and I know, as I said, O'Donnell is really interested in this Fitzgibbon Kennedy clash, the radical formalism, radical natural law a clash from the 1930s to Ryan and Lennon. He writes about, has written about it in an academic scholarship as well. And, you know, their, their disagreement was so stark that they were almost on two different plants. Like they were not almost not engaged in the same interpretive enterprise. Whereas, whereas I think McKechnie and uh, O'Donnell, it's quite different. And I like that, that they're so stridently at odds and yet uh, in, clearly engaged in a collaborative uh, endeavour to explore the meaning of the Irish constitution. So look, um, read the judgments, read the judgments. These videos only get you so far. Read the judgments themselves, really well worth it. And uh, do also ask questions and make comments, please, in the comments on this video, because uh, I will like, I would love to engage and will try to respond as best I can. Thank you very, very much.